is Allah, a chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he says, all on who spend in good cause. Good deeds are opportunities, sparkling bright and true. Raising you in the sight of Allah and adorning Al Jannah for you. So rush to earn his reward. Don't forget the oppressed. And when you go to sleep at night. Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salam ala Rasulil Kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mentabi'a sunnatuhu ila yomidin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome again to another episode of A Time to Please Allah here on Huda TV coming live from Dubai. Um, I'm your host Ismail Bullock and we have with us again today, and Brother Jibril is on his way of course, but we also have with us Brother El Amir. Yes, assalamu alaikum. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, looking very mm, colorful, very ready. Well, I don't know, mauvey, aren't you today? I. You know what? Because I just came back from vacation and I didn't wear a thobe over there. Like I went to Bosnia, so people in Bosnia wear, you know, uh, different style of clothes. So yeah, I was like, man, today I'm gonna put a thobe on, inshallah. Try to look good, man. Yeah. We got to know. Yeah. It's it's part of uh, being a Muslim. Yeah, of course. It's yeah. to dress nicely, to be clean, to smell good. Subhanallah, this this is one of those qualities that all the Muslims should have. I mean, we try, you know, and subhanAllah, what was, the one, what was one of the things that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to love in this dunya, right? There's different narrations, but one of them says, a nice perfume, yes, a nice house, a nice ride, and of course, a pious and good wife. And it's one of the narrations, other narrations uh, say something else. And uh, inshallah, this is what we all should try to emulate, you know. Well, you know, when you go to the masjid and when somebody is not smelling so good, Affects you, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those ones can be can be a nightmare. Oh, can really, man. like mess up in your prayer. Really, literally. I one time I had to hold my breath for the whole salah, um, and uh, you know it's difficult to concentrate. So, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, well, I mean, today we're going to have an, a, a guest coming on who's going to talk about their story to Islam. But I want to go back a bit because you're talking about Bosnia, and we had. Um, uh, Last week, I believe it was, unless I'm getting confused, or the week before. I think the week before. We had the Jibril talking about Romanian, Islam in Romania. So it would be nice for, until Jibril arrives and comes on, or to the first break, should I say, it would be nice if, we, if you could talk us a bit about what Islam is like in Bosnia, you know? The, uh, not necessarily the history of Islam in Bosnia, but... What is the current state? What it's like now, and w what it's like when you go there, and w what have you seen... Any negative changes, any positive changes, any improvements, that kind of thing? You know, it's a, it's a twofold answer. Basically, you, you said it yourself. There are improvements, but there are also negative things that have gone on since, you know, I've been... I go every couple of years or so. Um, but you have to remember that the, the Bosnia uh, is a Muslim country. I mean, majority Muslim, 50% or so, in the heart of Europe. And this is what the Europeans didn't want, is because, you know, to, for Bosnia to be in the middle of Europe, and Bosnian people are natives of Europe. They're not, you know, like immigrants in Germany or UK and so on. So there's been an enormous amount of pressure, even now, to abide by their rules and stuff like that. So a lot of, but subhanAllah, the Islam was saved in Bosnia. And that's why you see some things that are good and you see some things that are not so good. But then again, we were cut off from the Islamic world for a long time. So... That's, that explains some of the things that you see right now. So the practice over there is kind of weird sometimes. But at the same time, you know, you see good things. You see people and our Muslim sisters and brothers coming back to Islam. You see durus, you see, you see students coming back and doing things with the people. And people are, you know, subhanAllah, they love deen, they love Allah. And they do lots of good things. One of the things that, uh, uh, that I didn't like was that uh, me and my brother, for the first time together, we were in Bosnia for 22 years. And my mom came as well. Oh. 22 years together to be in Bosnia. My mom visited on different occasions. but And in our village, where we're from, unfortunately, it does not resemble a Muslim village. Even though all the people that live there, 
you know, their names are Muslim, they're Muslim, they say they're Muslim, yet nobody's praying, nobody's fasting, you'll find few people. And there's a masjid, they built a masjid, subhanAllah, these people are amazing. Like they will not pray or fast, but you know what, they will, they will build a masjid. They will spend their hard-earned money and they, build, they will build a masjid. The masjid will be the nicest building in town or in the, in the village. Yet, when we were there, we didn't hear the adhan. Then we asked the people, why we're not hearing the adhan? They say the imam is on annual leave. <laughs> <laughs> He's on annual leave, so nobody is doing the adhan, nobody's praying in the masjid. So that kind of hurt us a little bit. And then after two, two and a half weeks, then I heard the adhan, and subhanAllah, man, it was such a beautiful thing, you know. You, you see these green hills and valleys and rivers and little creeks flowing, and you hear them, and then the adhan comes, al-Maghrib time. And it's just amazing. And being a village, there's no city noise, so when the adhan calls, it, it really rumbles. And, and, and makes and makes makes your heart actually feel you know it trembles you really. Sounds like this is so nice, and I had to leave. <laughs> so I heard that once. So then, how will the people respond to you when they see you walking down with a beard and your wife, you know, dressed in Islamic attire? How do the people? You know, in my village, people know me, so they don't treat me as as bad as or as other places. Uh, they like to talk behind our backs and say things but then they say oh you're from us you're one of us you know you we know you that type of thing and I I've been going there like I said with a beard for the last 15 20 years and it was difficult in the beginning and I talked a lot in the beginning you know I tried to because I was so eager because all the things I learned that brought me back to Islam I tried to share with others and this is one of the things that we have to do Whatever we know, we should share we should, with others. And I was so eager and I would talk to them about so many things and so many beautiful stories of Sahaba and from the Seerah and they would not take it seriously. So, and that was like a, just, just a hearsay for them in a way because it's like, oh, you say something, it's like, oh, okay, okay, fine. What do I do about it? It's just a nice story, nothing else. Or rulings about Islam, which was very difficult to explain to them. But I decided we're not going to talk much. You know, we're just going to come and show and give them gifts and, 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 and be cordial and, and visit all of them. And subhanAllah, like in two weeks, we visited so many people. And everybody keeps saying, but you guys are always coming and visiting. This is so nice of you. And we try to tell them this is from Islam. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do. That we have to be nice to our kith and kin and also to our neighbors and our people. And hopefully, hopefully, inshallah, maybe one of them, maybe ten of them, you never know, we'll come back to deen. So literally you said, so when this monk, the imam came back and called the adhan, well, there's literally nobody in the mosque praying? No, because the imam says, if I'm not there, nobody else should be praying because you need to go to school for two years, three years in order to be imam. And I said to the imam, this was previous imam, which they all do the same thing. And I said to him, I said, you know, why don't you train somebody just to lead the prayer? Even if the person knows only a couple surahs. Because prayer is important, somebody in the village. And there's people capable of doing it. And he said, no, 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 this is a serious business, a serious issue. We cannot just let somebody lead the prayer like that. I don't know, maybe it's like a protective, they're protecting their, their I, I, I guess, their trade, you could say. Because the, the, the sad thing, Ismail, is that as here, as you, we know, you have a masjid and the imam resides next to the masjid, no? Or within the masjid, or next to the masjid. Same thing in Bosnia. The imam's house is next to the masjid. Literally, the imam would be on annual leave. He would be in his house, and he would not be opening the door or calling the adhan. Oh, it's not like he's traveling. So, well, sometimes he's traveling, but some part of vacation he may be home, and he's not opening the masjid. So that being <laughs> that said... That really is taking a bit too... Like yes. a, a career. Yeah. Then, uh, so that being said, it, it means like... It's, it, being an imam is, is actually a, a, a job, and it should not be a job. But when it actually was open, when you were there, I think you said you were there for like one prayer? Well, I did not expect the adhan, and I was traveling. So when I was sitting, in the, and I, I came back to visit again, because, you know, I went back and forth um, from the capital to my village, which is about two hours away, two and a half hours away. And uh, I sat down for, for coffee with my, uh, with my f family, with my, uh, my, my grandmother and my uncle. 
And then we're drinking coffee and I hear the Maghrib Adhan. And I'm like, oh, he's back? Yeah, he's back, you know. I didn't know. So it would be very hard for me to make it because over there when they make the Adhan, they start praying right away. Mm. So you never got a chance to see actually if anyone turned up and prayed? No. Well, I know there's people that pray. There's about five, seven, ten people that pray. Sounded very similar to Jibril's story of the Muslim areas. He went to Romania. He said the same thing, that there was some areas where they had the mosques and those particular villages were pretty much all Muslims. Of Tur- They call them Turks, but they could have come generations and generations ago. So they're Romanians, obviously. But he said the same thing. You'll find four or five old men praying or something. Yes. And he had also found that there was a time where the imam also wasn't around. So he wasn't open in the mosque. It, it remains yes. locked. Yes. Because he's gone on, same kind of thing, he'd gone on yes. leave or something. And you know, I was talking to Jibla about it yesterday, actually, and, and we, we, we know the same things because the, the I wouldn't want to say brand of Islam, but type of Islam that's being practiced in those, in those, in those areas, in Balkans, is a Turkish type of uh, old style. I'm not going to say current Turkish style. Old Turkish style that's been remnant from a long time ago. Where some of the things that they're doing are not correct. And so, but they try to survive, subhanAllah. You have to also give them credit that they've tried to survive. Can you imagine, like in Romania, it's even worse. Muslims, they are a supreme minority. We're talking about maybe 1%, maybe half a percent. In Bosnia, it's a little bit different. So those things. But I have to also say the positive things. In the capital, the situation is different. You go to the masjid and you see full, mashallah, big lines filled up. And imams, mashallah, with beautiful voices and good qira'ah and the rush are going on. But you'd expect the opposite, wouldn't you? You'd expect yeah. the village people are usually the more conservative, the more no, religious. No. And the people in the city are the ones you know, who are usually like more westernized, more into different vices and stuff. So you'd, that's what people would usually yeah. expect, but, right? But I, but I went to this famous village, this famous village in Bosnia called Sherici. And this business, this, sorry, this, this village... Uh, we'll have to go for a break, but let me just finish. This village is amazing, brother. From this village, which has maybe 100, 200, 300 houses, let's say. I was in Hajj in 2009 or 2008, and there were 44 people from that village who came for Hajj. So, and this year, I went for the first time to that village to visit it. And I was amazed, bro. You walk down the street, most, of, I say 90% of them weren't wearing hijab. 80%? They weren't or they were? They're wearing hijab. Okay, okay. They, they are conservative, people are praying. And I said to my friend who lives next to that village, I said, how is this possible? Like, subhanAllah, he says, yeah, this has been known for generations. This village is like that and villages around. So some parts in of Bosnia are very good. Where we are from, not so good. <laughs> and capital is moving up. And in Serbia, with the capital, I was praying. We prayed Juma one time. MashaAllah, the masjid was full. I mean, full. And there was so much youth praying Juma. You know, there were so much 16, 20, 20 year olds, 18 year olds, and they had come out of Masjid. It was, it was a beautiful sight to see, actually. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well, we better go for that break now. So, inshallah, join us after the break. It's time to please Allah, a chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he says. We can't just take knowledge and keep it as information. We have to transfer it into action. When he got up, he said one thing. Did the people pray? In Hajj, for example, the, the, the primary example of how multiculturalism really looks like, all equal. I've got a dentist in Canada. Even though he's ripping holes in my teeth, he's got great akhlaq. I love visiting him. Identify the issue. Analyze it. Challenge it. And then try again. Because if you fail, big deal. Try again and keep trying. (laughs) 
If I think I lost my ablution, but I'm not sure, do I have to make wudu again? Is it allowed for Muslims to visit the graveyard or is that shirk? Am I allowed to say Juma Mubarak to someone? Can I get to know a sister before marriage? I have so many questions and I feel that I've just reached a dead end. If only I could find someone trustworthy to answer my questions. Someone who speaks based on proof from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. To please Allah, a chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he said. Salam alaikum, welcome back to our show. Well, I'm a guest, uh, and uh, we're welcoming here. And just before we go back to our two guests who came, actually, and one of them is a host, um, just to finish with my what we talked about in Bosnia. So, there's positive things in Sarajevo. There's halakat and there are sisters, mashallah, who are very strong. So hang on, hang on. So one of the positive parts is there's sisters who are very strong? No, what I'm saying is sisters in Islam are strong. Okay, but why is, it, is, why is, why is that particularly <laughs> positive? What are the brothers in Islam? I said that before, <laughs> before the break, right? So I continued. I'm just pulling your leg, as they say. That's no, fine. You know what I'm saying is my wife, when she went to these halakat, she was amazed, you know. How, 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 it, you know, subhanAllah, the sisters are memorizing the Quran, they're having lots of children, and at the same time, they're trying to survive in an environment that's not, you know, that's kind of European type. Mm. So, being said, like you said, you had a, a great point, it was in the villages in, in, in where I'm from. Uh, so, in, in, in Bosnia, in, uh, in villages, they have these. People, the way they dress is 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 so, so not conservative or opposite of that. And in Sarajevo and the capital, the people dress a little bit better. So anyway, that's that for Bosnia. So let's welcome my dear friend, our dear friend, uh, Kevin. And Jibril is here now. So I'm a guest today, not a host. You're well, sitting in the host chair. So why are you like giving details? He's the host, he's a guest. You are the host today. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know all these intricacies. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, brother Kevin. Assalamualaikum. How are you? Abdullah, very yeah. good. Brother Kevin, he 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 is. He became Muslim in 2004, and we know him since then. Alhamdulillah, he's been a dear friend of mine and Jibril. Was it 2004? Or 2003. 2003, Three. December 2004, yeah. or something like that. At yeah. the end of 2003, because he was just like yeah. A month uh, or so difference from when I became Muslim. Yes, yeah, so yeah. really. So I, I think I became. I, see, I, I, I became first. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. You can became before him. And then what about Rob uh, Jibril? Uh, Rob was similar. At maybe, the same yeah, time, yeah. we're all like in within. Maybe he became so. Muslim before you a little bit. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Kevin did right because yeah. I remember I heard about Rob. I remember going to Asmat's house. Yes. And, and Rob then you met there. up with. The yeah, and then also Kevin. Also and our friend Asmatullah, Asmatullah, by the way, is also here. Yeah, he's out in the back somewhere. He's in the back. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Brother Kevin, let's start with... No, no, first of all, his name is now, mashallah, he follows the name of? Aisa. Aisa, mashallah. So, yeah, alhamdulillah. Okay, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your, your, yourself, first of all, who you are, how old you are, what do you do, and so on. And then we're going we're gonna to prime you in first, and then we're going to start... Uh, Dissecting you uh, all the way to people, I'm sure want to know everything about how you became. So you've been Muslim for almost the same time as myself. Yeah. Tell us about your name, about yourself, a little bit. What your you lineage. Mean? So yeah, myself. <laughs> um, you know, you can say I'm 
unless you're native, you know, I'm the closest you can get to a pure North American. <laughs> uh, my mother's side, you know, all branched from Canada. People came through the Underground Railroad, black people uh, mainly, African Americans. And my father's side from Alabama, uh, which is a very Christian-oriented state in, in America. They and call it the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt, right. right. So for very, some, very strong. For some reason, this is the, sorry to interrupt you, but this is the, uh, the problems of sometimes growing the West. I don't even know the song properly, but this that this that song just came in my head. Alabama. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Sweet home Alabama. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I don't even know. I must have heard that as a kid or something in a movie. Right. But as soon as you said that, Alabama just sweet clicked. Ha- yeah. Sorry, sweet. I'm just <laughs> randomly spurting stuff out, but yeah. No problem. So I was born in a, a border city uh, where Canada and the United States meet. So you have Windsor and the Canadian side, and Detroit and the American side. Mm-hmm. So the people there on both sides of the border interact with each other quite a bit. That's how my, mo- my mother and my father met. Um, you know, we came from a time where, you know, a lot of oppression was amongst the black uh, African-American culture. So my father lived through, you know, many of these stages of, you know, from, you know, leaving slavery into being able to work and do things that were not an option in his youth um, as an adult. Um, and living the street life and things like this. And then my father went back to his roots, you know, to the Bible and things that he had growing up. And he became, you know, a minister and then a pastor of a church. Mm -hmm. So he was very, you know, foundation in church by the time I was about 16 or 17 years old. Um, I lived with my mother and I grew up as a Christian under the banner of... um, Seventh-day Adventist. Mm-hmm. So this type of Christianity was very Old Testament. As a Christian, we didn't eat pork because this was in the Bible. You know, as a Christian, we prayed on Saturday, which emulates instead more what Sunday. the Jews do instead of Sunday. We, you know, this is so a very Old Testament version of Christianity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I grew up very open about my religion coming up. All my friends knew they'd come on Saturday and get me to ride bikes, and they'd be like, oh, it's Sabbath. You know, and... Just to, just to, sorry to interrupt you, I wanted to... I don't know if you guys are aware... There's a city called Loma Linda in California. Mm-hmm. It's run by Seventh Day Adventists. Mm-hmm. And in this city, there's no alcohol, there's no pornography, there is no pork, and it's like a modest city, and you have to dress in a certain way. Oh. And they were able to win uh, this in their city council, and people have to respect these rights. So it's, well. it's in California. It's in California, Loma Linda. And w- my colleague and uh, co worker, he went to university there. As a Saudi, <laughs> wow. and he was able to talk to them, and he, didn't have problem, he, he, so. he found nice things there. I mean, these guys, you know, uh, like he said, very Old Testament and very rigid in the in their practice. I mean, very strict. So anyway, yeah. just just to some mention something that in America this is possible, cool. by That's the way. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And in some Muslim countries, not. Yeah. 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 So, so growing up, I moved around a lot, um, and it made it so that. I was always in different schools and things. And always in these schools in the time growing up, I'd be the one of two black people, the only black person in the entire school. I grew up in a farming community because I was sick with asthma within the city limits of southern Ontario, so I moved into Toronto. And then moving forward, um, you know, with all those things where the odds were against me, you know, you know, for some reason, Allah would open up the door. You know, I'd meet some friends at school, and he'd be like, man, I really like you. You've got to come to my house. I go to his house and his parents would be like, man, maybe I didn't teach my children right. You know, he brought home a black guy. I don't even know what to say here. And sometimes they speak a different language and they would speak to their children in their language. But by the next visit, they would call for me. The parents would say, you know, we're cooking some traditional food. We would like to have you, you know. So all these different things, the options always opened up for me. So later, really forwarding fast, you know, when this 9-11 thing happened, you know, George Bush and this campaign is saying, you know, these people are, are fanatics and about their God and their issues with their God. And, you know, we got to watch our backs in a sense. So for me, you know, I, I didn't know. I never heard of Islam. I was 27 years old, never met a Muslim. And I was very curious, you know, p- friends that I had, I would see things on their wall. And I say, what's this? And they say, oh, it's from our religion. I learned a little bit from them. And, you know, I always kept that with me. But when it came to, you know, Muslims, I'm thinking, I've never met any of them, you know. So I got to find out before I start jumping on the bandwagon. Because where people should have been against me, they weren't, you know. Mm-hmm. So I had to, 
you know, take the same precaution before I just start talking. I didn't have that place in my life, so I'm not going to take it as an advantage now. So I had a friend for 11 years, and uh, his name was Mahmoud. And I remember, you know, I never knew he was Muslim. I just, you know, we in Canada, if we walk by your house, we just knock on the door. You know, we don't ask, we don't call. You know, we just knock on the door, are you home? So I'd knock on his door, his mom would come, and she'd just creak the door. And then she'd close it. And then she'd come back, and then she'd ask me who I was looking for, and then she'd ask for him. But I never noticed she was putting on hijab. You know, I didn't even pay attention to the fact that she was doing that. So, you know, when this thing started coming with the Iraq, and they were saying, you know, now we have to go take care of business in Iraq, when, you know, it didn't look clear to why, you know, I thought to myself, man, this is it. You know, in, the, in, the, in our Western culture, we always believe that in World War III, when this happens, you know, this is going to be the dawn of the end of the world. So I said, is this it? You know, I said, I don't know what to do. So I start looking at my Bible. I said, what does it say about the end of the world? And it's very vague, to say the least. But I've seen movies about it. And the movies were story-oriented and, you know, different things that, you know, we believe came from the Bible. But when I read it from the Bible, it doesn't match the movie. So I'm like, well, how did they do that? So then I read a story uh, on the Internet, you know, about the Dijal, you know, the Antichrist in our, you know, Western world with our terminology. And uh, when I read this story, I said, this must be a good movie. You know, I didn't see this one. You know, it's very detailed. I said, I never, you know, seen this one. Mm -hmm. But then I seen something about Arabic in the bottom. So I ran to Mahmoud's house. I said, you know, again, <laughs> no calling or anything. I said, Mahmoud, come out here. I said, what do you know about this? And he's asking me, you know, well, how did you hear this? You know, you hear me spit out an Arabic name. You know, he's laughing to himself. Like, this is pretty funny. I must have, you know, rubbed off on him a little bit. So then when he mentioned the story, he said it generally word for word what I just read. And ten minutes ago. And I said, this is, this is strange. I said, how do you know about this? He said, well, back home, you know, this is part of my culture and my religion. And I said, Mahmoud, you don't know anything about back home. You've been here since you're nine years old. Don't tell <laughs> telling me stories about back home because you don't have a back home. All right, you're Canadian. So, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, that to me was the first sign, you know, and it kind of opened the road up for me to read more. And moving forward from there, you know, I, I had started playing basketball and I met Alamir and his brother on the basketball court. Where was this? This was in Windsor. But where exactly? This uh, was on, on Karen and University Avenue, next to downtown Windsor. Okay. Yeah, okay. very downtown, very happening spot. You know, people would have their cars parked there, music yeah, out of yeah. the back, everybody's but, watching. But people used to play a lot of basketball, you know, after Asr, mm -hmm. just before Maghrib. And me and Kamal used to play, and it was nice. They were... The nets were like different sizes, okay. different heights, I mean. So and my brother loved dunking, and he couldn't dunk on a 10-foot rim. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he would, you know. It was very we, competitive, yeah. too. You know, yeah, the games were, you know, real deal. Yeah. Okay. So, of used to come and that, you, know. you know, some guys were talking about something, and I was educating them about this 9-11 situation and what I've seen and what I know. And these guys kind of took to, you know, a regular Canadian guy talking about this. You know, other people in the world, you know, view this from certain perspectives, but why, you know, is this guy talking about this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember they talked to me a little bit about Islam. Have I ever heard about it? And I said, no. And then they mentioned Malcolm X. And I said, oh, I've seen that movie. But I never really picked up on the Islamic, you know, right. message in the movie. It was more like the black people coming out of oppression. That was the message I took from that movie because I lived it. My father lived it. You know, this was a big thing. So we'd be playing basketball and we'd be next. You have to wait many games, three, four times for other people to finish. And then you come in the court. So, you know, they'd be on my team, and we'd have necks, and they'd be packing up their shoes. I'd be like, well, where are you guys going? They'd be like, we got to go pray. I was like, now? We got next. You know, we're next. We waited like half an hour for this. <laughs> They're like, we're sorry. And that just, you know, really stuck out to me. I'm like, this is, this is something else. You know, these guys are going to leave the basketball court and go pray. And sometimes they'd even come back later. You know, if it was an early prayer, they'd come back later, and we'd play again. And, you know, slowly we grew a relationship. And, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, they were giving me videos and different literature and things like this. And, you know, I had this next door neighbor. She was a, a, a girl there next door to me, a little bit older than me. And, you know, I would give her the papers too and, and mm -hmm. the videos and stuff. And she'd be like, yeah, this is, this is amazing, you know. So both of us are kind of getting the same experience. And then, you know, I remember it came later. I, was, uh, I, I took Shahada on December 28th, 2003. Mashallah. 
and uh, right before New Year's. Yeah, it's good for you. right before New Year's. So I, I made a I made a pact with myself. I said, "This is it." New Year's resolution. <laughs> yeah, I said, "You know, I'm going to become Muslim." You know, I, this is real to me. You know, I put everything on the table from what I knew. My mom at the time was a Jew, and she was following Judaism. And I had met some rabbis. I grew up with the Christianity, and now I'm learning about Islam and you know some different things. Yes, so at this point, you know, I put everything on the table. I said. You know, now with this, this Iraq thing, I said, if, if I'm going to have to fight, you know, who would I fight for in, in the end of the world battle? <laughs> and I said, I know I have problems with what I'm reading here in the media and what I'm getting here. You know, I have different perspective on some of these things. So I said, you know, they keep relating that these Muslims and their God and this thing. So I said, what if somebody really is on the side of God? I said, you know, if there is, I'll fight for that. You know, I don't care who they are. You know, if God really exists, so I said, God, show me something. So I looked into Judaism, and I don't know a whole lot, so I'm looking at it, and I said, wow, okay, these are my prophets, this is great, this is great, this is great, they only pray to God, I'm great with that, this is what I do, but there's no Jesus. I said, I never knew that, no Jesus. <laughs> I said, man, I've never really seen somebody make a case that was solid enough to make me turn my back on Jesus. You know, I never in my life ever called on Jesus mm -hmm. in the way that some Christians do, but I don't go out of my way to say, you know, I, I, can't, I can't believe that he existed. So then I look at Christianity, all you need is Jesus. You know, if you just accept Jesus, you know, regardless of your deeds and your duties and things like this, you're going or to heaven. Or misdeeds. Yeah, or your misdeeds, right? <laughs> you're going to heaven. You know, you get to a funeral, a Christian funeral, this guy's in heaven. The guy re that's, that's, that's orchestrating the funeral has never even met this guy. But he knows 100% this guy's in heaven right now looking at this. I said, how do you know this? You know, this guy could have a secret life somewhere. You don't know anything about this. So but you're telling us he's in heaven. So I said, you know, I never got anything in life free. You know, but the biggest thing you can achieve in life is absolutely free. I said, let me look a little bit further. <laughs> you know, so I look into Islam and I say, man, okay, all my prophets are here. Jesus, we're in your game. And then they only pray to God. I said, this is what I do. And next they said that there's a new prophet. And I read some things about him and I said, you know, I could probably accept this too if I read into it. You know, I haven't heard anything very negative and what I'm hearing now is, is great. So I said, this is for me. You know, simple, you know, that was as simple as the decision was. You know, these guys I met in the basketball court, you know, they're talking the talk and they're walking the walk. You know, when I go in my church, it's a little bit different, <laughs> you know, to say the least. You know, I've seen some things and at that time, being in my 20s, I returned a few times to church and, you know, it just wasn't appealing to me as, as much from what I've seen it grow from. You know, ladies were very covered in my day. My mom wore a hat and a long dress. You know, if you walked into a church now, no. The people are lined up outside the church. If you took the church out of the background, you wouldn't know if they're in the front of a club or in front of a church. <laughs> you know, this is how I felt. So people are supposed to look at the pulpit in the church. Yeah. But they will look at something else. Subhanallah. You know, this is, this is <laughs> how it was. Listen to the priest. <laughs> so back to December 28th, uh, the guys, they would just show up more in a Canadian fashion and they would have them be in the neighborhood because Asmatullah only lived houses away from me. So once in a while they stop by and they say, well, would you like to go to the mosque with us? I said, yeah, let's go. And, you know, I told them my, my analogy, you know, I'm going to become Muslim. You know, this is very close to New Year's Eve, so I have one more party I have to attend. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to become Muslim and then go party New Year's Eve. You know, I'm not a hypocritical type person. So I said, but when I come back, you know, you guys, let's go to the mosque. We're going to do it. So they all agreed. They said, great. So we get to the mosque, and we have a brother in our community who's very, very nice brother, and he's very busy, you know, amongst the Muslims in the community. His name's Dr. Murad. So they introduced me to Dr. Murad. I said, Dr. Murad, this is Kevin. He's actually interested in Islam. He just wanted to come to the mosque tonight, and, you know, we saw you here, so we'd like you to meet with him. And he just, you know, said hi, and they prayed, and then they gathered after the prayer for a small talk. And, you know, I told him, yes, this is it for me. You know, this is what I like, and I want to become Muslim. So... You know, this is my plan again. I told him about the plan. I got to go to party first. Yeah, I got I to do the New, New Year's Eve. Is You know, I live for this, right? This is where I came from, man. And he took his so, <laughs> right. So Dr. Murad said yes, and he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, what if you don't make it back? Mm. I said, it's a, good, that's, it's a good way to look at it. And he's like, you know, why don't you become Muslim now? You know, you may not come back from that party. And he said, you know, you're better even as a Muslim that went to a party than not to be having your chance to become Muslim. Yep. I said, you're right. So right there on the spot, you know, they helped me to announce my shahada in the masjid. And, you know, that was the first step. 
you know, becoming Muslim. Uh, so I became Muslim. And everybody hugged you, right? Yeah, everybody hugged me. You know, I got free books because we had a bookstore back then. And that was the one thing that really kept me close to Islam. The, you know, walking in the bookstore and see how many topics about things that Islam wants to talk about. You know, hmm. in Christianity, you know, our bookstore consisted mainly of Bibles and some of the hit TV guys, you know, autobiographies right. and things like this, but never so expansive. You know, I remember seeing a book on cheese. <laughs> really, a book <laughs> just about cheese. You just, just want to write a book about cheese and how it falls into the faith of Islam. I said, SubhanAllah, mm. you know, this is, this is deep. So, what was, your, what was your father's reaction? The funny thing was, very soon after I became Muslim, my, my grandmother on my father's side died. And it brought us together. Uh, my father was married before my mom, so I had three older sisters, you know, ranging from about eight years up to about 17 years older than me. And we met at this funeral, and uh, you know I was wearing like a thawb and things like this. See, so right away you took on thawb. Eh? Yeah, right away. You know, <laughs> I, I'm I, I'm either go go big or go home. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is the way we do things, man. So, I, uh, you know, see my dad, and you know he was surprised. He he he's a down to earth guy though. He doesn't really you know attack things. You know he wants to more understand things. So we talked a little bit. But my sister, she came and she said, "Wow." No, you're Muslim. I said, yeah. And she, said, she said, I've been Muslim for 19 years. Oh, I man. said, get out of here. You got to hold that. Okay. You got to hold on to that. You're going to tell us about that. I didn't know that. Bro. Wait, next wait, wait. Yeah, that's why we're going to have to hold on to it <laughs> okay. because we have, we have to go for a break. Okay. So we'll go for a break and we'll be back, inshallah, after this few minutes. Time to please Allah. A chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he says. Ya ذا الجلال والإكرام يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها وأجرنا من خزي الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا وأصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأصلح لنا آخرتنا التي إليها معادنا وجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير وجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر try to recap what we do here at Huda TV for the past week and we try to share with you some of the latest news that is happening behind the scenes here at the station. Living Islam would love a cooking show to be aired for Arabic dishes. Also more programs for children regarding manners. We want to go ahead and take a look at our YouTube page right now and see how it looks as, as it stands. Well, I'm on the screen right now but I'm not on TV. I'm actually uh, through YouTube as you can see right there. It's the same exact thing that you see on TV here live It's exactly the same thing that is on our YouTube page through our live streaming a great way to stay in touch with you. My first uh, time to call uh, Huda TV, but uh, I like it uh, too much Because there is no program in Huda TV that it is not important for our Muslims inshallah <laughs> It's time to please Allah, a chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he said. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back from the break. And just as we left, Brother Kevin, you're just, a, you're just telling us how you met your sister and you found out that SubhanAllah she'd been a Muslim for 19 years. Yes, I didn't know that bro. 
Subhanallah. Yeah, so now I need to know. I'm excited. But you know, your family is scattered all over the United States and Canada, yes. isn't it? So that's, yeah. That's my sister was in Atlanta. So your sister from your father's side. Yes. Okay. Yes. Before. So okay. my stepsister oh, basically. Okay. She uh, had moved oh, to Atlanta. Stepsister or half sister? Half sister. Half sister. Half sister. Half sister yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Tec technically, yes, my half sister. So this man likes to correct. He's very technical. <laughs> <laughs> because he's obviously, he's step sister technical. in theory is not really related. What is a half sister? No, no, you're right, so you're I was right, just trying yeah. to understand it. Was it actually like his sister from his dad, or was it literally yeah, the half sister, the half daughter sister. of his dad's new wife? That's why I was trying to confirm it. Right. Yes. So yeah, the, the sister from my dad. Yeah, from his previous uh, marriage. So you know, we really sat and talked a lot, and she met my wife, and. Uh, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, it was, it was nice to know. And I was even asking her because I know, you know, most people that know Islam, they're African-American, especially in Detroit and Chicago, you know, they know different things about Islam. But she, you know, knew about the Sunnah of the Prophet so She was not like Nation of Islam or anything like that? No, no. Oh, so. she, you know, that's what I thought. But no, she, you know, was very much, you know, from our Sunnah of the Prophet oh, so. I said, this is even more amazing, you know. And, uh -huh. That really amped me up. I wanted to give dawah to my father, but I was still so new. But when you're very new, you really just always want to hit the, the pedal to the metal, you know? So I remember, you know, speaking with my father, and, you know, he knew more than me, <laughs> especially in the, in the means of misconceptions. So he right. finally stumped me, and, uh, you know, I was really stumped. And I said, SubhanAllah, I had to go back and meet with the brothers and the <laughs> imam, and, you know, we had to talk. And so still, I haven't been back to you know, educate my father again, but, you know, our relationship is good. I visit and things like yes, this. Doctor. He's always very happy to have us come by, my wife and my, you know, children and things like this, and they're very good at hosting. So there's a good relationship there, you know, much help. you guys never got into it. Uh, we haven't, you know, haven't returned back to the to the table yeah. yet, but inshallah, you, you know, should, I'm yeah. very, very much, you know. I think now you're ready. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. I'm more, more ready <laughs> with the knowledge that I have, and uh, still just as excited to, to talk again because I know my dad you know is a person that wants the truth you know he's not saying you know I'm all oh, I know all this and I'm only doing this because this is what I know you know he's very logical and educated so I think inshallah you know my mom you know alhamdulillah she took shahada uh, a year and a half ago uh, my wife who was my next door neighbor that I spoke about that's what I was going to ask what happened to the next door neighbor that was yeah. <laughs> so you know it was, I became Muslim in December 28th in the following April, you know, she was saying, you know, she really liked this stuff and what we were reading. And these guys, again, you know, they came to my house and just knocked the door. And they said, yeah, we're going to go. You want to come with us? And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I have some engagements that I have to meet with. And they said, you mean like girlfriend? I said, well, you know, maybe something like that, I guess, if you want to say that. <laughs> and uh, they said, you know, in Islam, we don't really practice the dating thing. I said, really? And these guys were very good with me. You know, they yeah. never were pushy. But, you know, they knew if, if I knew about the information, it was not a problem for me to apply it. So they showed me some things, you know, between the Quran and some things online. And Abdul Qadir was, uh, he, was, yeah. he was important in this. One so, of our brothers from the masjid, yeah. Yeah, so they said to me, you know, they said to that to me, and then they proved it to me. I said, okay, hold on one second. I ran downstairs, and I ran next door, and I said, I said, look, to the, you know, this is girl. what you're serious about. I was like, we can get married. And for her, this was a good thing. She was like, perfect, we'll get married. So I came back and I said, <laughs> told them what happened. <laughs> the brothers yeah, he like, shocked us. He shocked us. The brothers were like, really? I was so, like, yes, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So, you know, we, we made that arrangement. Uh, April came. Uh, my wife took Shahada, and the same day we got married. Nice and subhanAllah, I remember, you know, I came from a different type of background. You know, marriage was the last option most people look for in, in a relationship. So it took me a long time, you know, to adjust. And, you know, these brothers, they worked with me, alhamdulillah. And, you know, one of the brothers at the mosque who was, you know, very good with us, very knowledgeable brother, Abdul Qadir Taibi, uh, Dr. Abdul Qadir. Uh, he sat with us many times, as, as did Sheikh Mustafa, our imam at the time, you know, to help us. You know, understand, you know, what your relationship is for. You know, that your relationship, even as a husband and a wife, is something that you're doing for the sake of Allah. Mm. You know, not for what this person has or what this person can gain. You know, and this is, alhamdulillah, you know, I'm 10 years, almost 11 years into my marriage. And, you know, I love it. I love my wife. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, she has children, I have children. We've never had children together though, but you know, things are just working out with us and you know, it's a great relationship and you know, just Islam was able to make all of this work. You know, a lot of people, you know, see that as a big thing that they don't want to do when they have a sister that has children from a prior relationship. Mm. But, you know, I can only say, you know, brothers, you got to step up. You know, there's sisters. This is very sisters. important, that what you're saying right Yeah, now. there's <laughs> sisters who are having issues here, and, you know, yeah, Jibril well, you can know, fill us in. Yeah, because there's, I get a lot of emails from sisters, uh, mothers of daughters, uh, brothers of, of their sisters, you know, even calling me on the phone sometimes saying that, you know, I have, uh, you know, my daughter, like, or something, or my, my, my you know, my sister or someone, uh, you know, she's divorced or never married, or, and a lot of them are, like, divorced or widows, and they have one child or two children. And do you know anyone? You know, you guys are on TV, you guys are doing this, you guys must know people, must know brothers. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I it's don't know point. anyone. I'm sorry. And I, I ask, I'm telling you, I ask. We, you know, we meet a lot of brothers. Yeah. And the brothers are like, Maybe oh, now yeah. we're going to so go taboo. Uh, uh, and right, right now we're going to go play football. And there's so many brothers are going to come there. And we're going to pose the same question. And we're going to get what? I, I've already posed this before. <laughs> well, we're going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but the thing is that, you know, you, you say like, uh, you know, how old is she? 29. Oh, excellent. Um, from where? This. Okay, oh, yeah, good. Uh, but she has a child. Uh, oh, she has a child. How old is the child? You know, seven years old. Oh, okay, um, okay, that's good. No problem. Uh, let me get back to you. You know, yes. it's, it's always man like this. Almost the same story, you know. Subhanallah. Sorry to. It's know. almost yeah. It's right. It's almost taboo for some brothers, but you know, I've been in the situation as a stepchild myself. Um, you know, I, I'm open to stepchildren in my relationship, and it is a very good relationship. You know, my wife has two daughters, and alhamdulillah, they're very good sisters, and you know. It's it's just been great, you know. And you you your wife, she has a sister. Yes. Who became Muslim. Sure. But you know she had some issues. She ran into issues. You know, living in the West, there's always some, yeah. some some difficult issues. The previous life. Hmm. Uh, and she had two two kids. Hmm. And you guys pretty much raised them, right? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yes. And those two kids, Subhanallah, even though the mother is not with them too much right now, they're actually. Practicing, they go to the masjid and they, they dress well, those. Was his name is Elijah, right? Elijah. 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 I remember Elijah. And, uh, Isaiah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Yeah, and you know, Elijah, you know, loves Who do they live with now? Uh, they live with my mother in law right now. Yes, as sir. my, you know, sister in law is, is struggling with Western life. You know, it's a very encompassing <laughs> lifestyle, you know, and it's hard to be a Muslim. You know, it's hard to be a practicing Muslim. And you know, this is what I say in these relationships, you got to watch out for these kids. You know, we as men, you know, are the only ones that can take these children in and, and you know, give them something that can put strength in, 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 in themselves with Allah. You know, it's tough for the sisters to do it all alone. And, you know, my other job at the mosque is I work at the youth club. So basically I have all the male youth of the community and we bring them together as brothers. Ranging from what age to what age? Just so we have guys as young as uh, fifth grade, so you're probably looking at you know, eight or nine years, years old, old ten years old, all the way through university. You know, we've basically graduated some brothers that started at ten years old. Now they're you know, second, third year university oh, students. So. Uh, at the mosque now this year we've done some renovations because of you know, my relationship with the youth. Uh, the university guys love that atmosphere of the mosque. So what, what do you have in the youth club, so just to be sure to know? So th because in the West, a masjid is not just a masjid where you go pray. Yeah. Masjid is a center so of happening. Yeah. Yes. There's everything there. Yeah, so sure. for the youth, we have everything from billiards to foosball to PlayStation 4, you know, things that attract the youth, you know, and then it gives us an opportunity to, want, for one, bridge the gap, the generation gap. Mm -hmm. You know, some brothers a little bit older can sit with brothers that are a little bit younger and be on the same level. We play with them and things like this. Basketball leagues, soccer leagues, all these different things happen from the basis of mm -hmm. the youth club. And then we sit and we have talks, we go camping, we do all different things to educate our youth and make it, you know, something that they like. And from the first generation that I worked with and graduated, if you want to say, you know, they called me and they said, Kevin, man, you know, I'm in university now. And man, we're studying at this place and what a fitna. You yeah. know, everywhere I look. You know, and these guys, you know, now they're starting to get that feeling of wanting to be married and, you know, they, yeah. they know what they want. So they said, can you help us? So this year we did a fundraiser and now we have a study center similar to what's at the university with multimedia, whiteboard, computers, 
study carols. So all this stuff quiet is open. Quiet areas. Yeah, quiet stuff. areas. So now it's yeah. opening right now for this year's okay. study year. So we're trying to you know, do everything so, from so, the mosque. So these like guys can study in peace and relax, not to go in. And you guys also organize like uh, summer camps, from what I know. And you have like a basketball tournaments, yes. floor hockey tournaments, soccer tournaments, day trips, day yes. trips yeah. and all these things, right? Yes. And a lot of people, mashallah, they come in. And also... Um, and, and this is all in, in, in keeping the youth with the jama'ah in a way. Yeah, in the jama'ah. So yeah. the Muslims can interact with each other. And at the same time, when the salah time comes, they go for salah. Right. And there is uh, the rules, there's lectures. And just sense of brotherhood, you know, because you are who you're with. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's the most important message, you know, is, yeah. you know... I wanted to, uh, before we, you know, I think we're coming close. Um, in your, you had a game shop. Yes. Back right. in 2004. <laughs> so, yeah. We have to go back <laughs> yeah, to that. We have to go back. <laughs> uh, game shop where people used to uh, either browse the internet or play games. Xbox yes. at that time and PlayStation. And we used to come and play with you. I mean, I, I say I still play games. I'm not being shy <laughs> about it. Um, it's something we do. And, and subhanAllah, we used to come to your shop and we used to play and we used to get so many people, different people to come. And you did one thing for them. You would put the videos, or Islamic videos. <laughs> and how many people accepted Islam through your shop? SubhanAllah. Through my internet cafe uh, slash video game store, uh, my best friend, uh, Bill Curley, he accepted Islam. Um, various youth that were just from the, the community that hung out there, I'm thinking maybe closer to eight or nine people. You know, came through the shop and they just the way we treated them you know um, I Mahmoud remember you guys had like a prayer uh, space downstairs yes. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's the prayer we set it up and we, we used to go pray downstairs <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know and just every once in a while we put on like Khalid Yassin right. you know if it's quiet in the shop let's just put on the video so we put on like Purpose of Life uh, some brother had a whole bunch of pamphlets and we put them all on our counter you know those small right. one minute reminders and you know you see parents waiting for their child to finish and they pick one up they're reading it. And they just read it, and they have a smile on their face, you know, people... Yeah, we used to bring Discovery Islam, you know, Discovery right. Islam pamphlets. Yeah. Right. So, and sometimes someone would ask, and we'd talk with them a little bit, and people were always comfortable, you know, to know that, you know, most of them were not Muslims, the children there, but they're comfortable with their children being there with these Muslims. Hmm. You know, it was, it was... They would ask, this was the weird thing, bro. This was the weird thing. And it was, it was scary for me and for other brothers. Some of the parents would ask us to take care of their 12 or 13 year old daughter who used to come to the shop. So, huh. And this is a big thing in Canada. I mean, yeah. they would accuse you or something and say you're with a minor or something like mm -hmm. that. And she's a, she's a girl who's not related to you mm -hmm. and you're not a neighbor or something like that. And we were afraid. But the mother would say to us, you know, she would call in and say, please watch out for her. Don't let her go out. You know, she's playing there. It's good. You know, problem. But just please tell me when she leaves so then I can you know, know that she's coming home and stuff like that. So yeah, man. So the parents, like the community developed a trust in it. Yeah. They realized, yeah. that, okay, these guys are offering a service, whatever game, whatever, but they're like serious but and it's religious. But it's a safe, and safe yeah, environment. It's a safe environment, yeah. And one of the things that Kevin, he was very strict on, and I used to work in the shop too a little bit, <laughs> it was uh, not to swear. No mm -hmm. swearing. Uh, if, if you get upset, no, you know, you get upset, but calm down, take it easy, and all these things. So, I mean, it was like an environment that you could say like a, almost like an Islamic environment, even among the non-Muslims. Uh -huh. yeah. Because, you know, you have to have a certain level of, 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 of uh, behavior that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's acceptable. Hmm. Yeah, we always tried to Unfortunately, keep Unfortunately, did not balance. last because the business went down for other reasons. But yeah. Alhamdulillah, it served its purpose, man. Yeah. Eight, nine well, people, for a good year, for a good, for a good year, right? Maybe. That's Three. what it was all about. No, I mean, uh, since oh. you became Muslim, like, yeah. it lasted for another year, year and a half yeah. after that. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. MashaAllah. I want to ask you, uh, just I guess I don't know how much time we have, but one thing that uh, obviously a lot of people might have, and it, well, a lot of people are struggling with from the Ummah, is the issue of, of uh, music. And you know, coming from the background and you know, like, like yourself, myself, growing up in the West, we know that like rap and you know, hip hop, uh, hip -hop and all this is a big part. And I remember one thing that people whenever they knew of Kevin is like Kevin on rollerblades with these big headphones, you know, and like freestyling it, right? How was it, you know, making that transition from, uh, from music to, to the Qur'an, for example, and having to leave that? Because there's some people who literally are like, they can't give up music. And even for myself, when I speak about it, it's like I'm still having like backflashes, you know, of like 
you know, I, I used to play like the saxophone. I used to be in uh, some kind, you know, like kind of like a, a break dancer and all kinds of stuff, you know. Right? So, uh, and, you know, we Alamir, all Alamir was a break dancer. But I don't know if you know Islam, but uh, he was a big. Uh, I used dancer. to play the f the flute. <laughs> 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 so, so yeah, how was how was that transition? You know, uh, it was it, it came at the right time. I think you know what happened. You know, I used to be a DJ, and I used to love music. You know, very deeply. And, uh, you know, I came from, you know, rock and roll and Beatles and stuff when I grew up. Uh, Wait, you like rock and roll and the Beatles? Yeah, when I grew up, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Weird, you know, man. Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> Beatles, Frank Zappa, these odd names that, you know, a lot of kids now won't hear. But I remember no, you, you also had, like, dreadlocks yeah. when you were, right? So yeah. you were into, like, uh, reggae music as well? Or? Yeah, so when I was young, uh, probably between 15 and 17, I used to set up reggae dance hall. That okay. was my thing. You know, I was, I'm very technologically inclined, so yeah. this so was my thing, setting up these <laughs> big, huge speaker systems. So, and then I would just sleep on the speaker system because I wasn't a huge fan of reggae. At that time, you know, I, I was more into hip-hop. But hip-hop at the time was a very uh, different thing than it is now. Mm. You know, hip-hop was a way that African-Americans were able to voice themselves and be heard. The public enemy kind of stuff. Yes, exactly, exactly. Public but, enemy but and things like this. the hip-hop you used to listen to even in the day, and we have to finish soon, inshallah, uh, is that the hip-hop that was not so... Uh, uh, discriminating against women. That's at it. that yeah. time, it was just a message type uh, of hip hop. You had yeah. those. Uh, you you had obviously NWA, right? That was the first. But they were like the. I think they were quite unique in that, right? When it comes to the uh, the degrading of women and the uh, just for the fun of it, swearing and stuff. Whereas yes. you had Public Enemy, they would talk about the whole slave scenario, right? Yes. Like shut them down and all those kinds yeah. of songs, right? So there was a big. Big difference. Very knowledgeable. Yeah, so. and that's. Well, I, I used to listen to stuff. So. <laughs> See, you, you find some things even <laughs> so. on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it was, you know. Uh, the the general message of hip hop was, you know, I'm American. I live in this neighborhood in this city, and look around me, you know. But other people are living in the same city, in different neighborhoods, and things are getting properly taken care of by the government. Why not here? Mm. You know, that was the main basis of a lot of the music. You know, so we. We have to cut it here short. Um, I think we have <laughs> to bring uh, Kevin back okay. or something. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say that because I'm not. A, I'm just a replacement host. <laughs> I think we're gonna, no, we, we have much that we have to. Yeah, he'll, he'll be here for a couple more weeks so yeah, we can so schedule we'll something. Like Maybe we'll bring Asmat Allah in also. I think that would be good. Yeah, Asmat Allah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good show. So, so Jazakallah well, khair for coming. Welcome. Thank you for having me. That was. Uh, I mean, I, I I learned a few things that I I you know I've known you for so long and still yes. learning. You know, so <laughs> that was a good show. So, and I also learned that Ismail is very. Knowledgeable, no, no, knowledgeable about, about yeah. We'll, we'll talk, talk about, about it actually. MashaAllah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, inshallah. So uh, join us. I mean, enough said really. Join us, inshallah, next week. Same time, same place. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A to gain reward. I will spend on you, he says. All on who spend in good cause Good deeds are opportunities Sparkling bright and true Raising you in the sight of Allah And adorning Al-Jannah for you So rush to earn his reward Don't forget